In this video, we're going to discuss price indexes in, and inflation. Prices are changing all the time, and economists need to understand how changes in prices are affecting economic decisions and economic activity. We use a price level. A price level is an average of all prices that occur in an economy. And a price level can help us understand changes in purchasing power of money over time. Now, when a price level is increasing, when prices are going up, we call that inflation. And when prices are going down, when the price level is decreasing, we call that deflation. And so fundamentally, what we're trying to understand is the difference between changes in real values in the economy, are more things being produced, and changes in money values. Maybe the same number of things are being produced, but the money values have changed. And so this is how we use um, price levels in, in, in economics to try to understand what's happening to prices overall. Now, in economics, low, steady, and anticipated inflation, or for that matter, deflation, is not considered a problem because people, when it's low and steady and anticipated, they can make economic plans and carry out their economic actions. The uh, low levels of inflation or, or deflation or, or, uh, uh, can be incorporated into economic planning. But when inflation is unpredictable or it's high, um, then it becomes a much bigger problem because it interferes with the economic plans and actions of people. It, uh, inflation can redistribute income and wealth in arbitrary ways between employees and workers, between borrowers and lenders, in, in, in ways that, that interfere with economic planning and interfere with the, with the proper allocation uh, of resources in an economy. And in fact, if inflation becomes uh, out of control, if it becomes ho so high uh, at its worst, it's called a hyperflation. And this is when money, uh, the prices are rising so quickly within a matter of minutes or hours uh, or days that the money completely loses its value. Here in the picture, um, this is from uh, Zimbabwe in 1994. Somebody's buying three eggs with a hundred billion dollar bill. Uh, in this case, there was a hyperflation, and the money basically fails. The money becomes not useful as a store of value or as a medium of exchange. And this is what happens when we have a hyperflation, when inflation gets completely out of control. Now. We, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, measures and calculates and publishes something called the Consumer Price Index, which is basically um, an index or uh, an indicator, a, a, a macroeconomic indicator that tries to measure the level of prices overall. Here we can see um, the Consumer Price Index over the last 20 years or so, and um, it's sometimes, um, you know, Prices are increasing in the 5% range. Sometimes they're decreasing uh, and, and, and even negative. On average, this probably, if we drew a line for this chart, it would be about 2 or 3%. And that's what economists generally consider to be um, low, um, you know, steady and anticipated inflation. But there are times when it's quite higher, um, when it's above 5% uh, or even when it's as, as high as um, nine or ten percent as it is here in the middle of the year 2022. Now the consumer price index is a composite. There's many parts that go into making it up and so as you can imagine with any composite there are some parts that are higher, some parts that are lower. Um, at this particular time you can see that things related to energy and, and uh, fuel oil and even electricity are much higher. Um, are increasing at a, at a very rapid rate, and there's some things that are increasing at, um, at, uh, at, at a slower rate. Now, the Consumer Price Index measures the average of 
prices paid by urban consumers for a fixed basket of consumer goods and services. So the consumer price index is calculated a very specific way. It's meant to be an average of lots of goods and services um, paid for by urban consumers for, for a steady basket of goods. And you can see they try to take the representative things people spend their money on, housing and transportation and health care and food, and those are the things that go into the consumer pr price index. There's actually eight uh, categories. Now, in order for the index to work, we have to calculate that average in a base period. The current base period is 1982 to 84. So, um, you know, almost 40 years ago. And whatever the average of all the goods and services we count up during that period is, we set, we set that equal to 100. We then go back and calculate the, the prices of all those goods and services for the same goods and services at another time, say in August 2022, when the consumer price index was 296.31. So based on that, we can say that the same goods and services cost 196% more in the year we're talking about, in this case 2022, than they did in the base year. Um, and so inflation has gone up for the price level, if, if you will. The, the consumer price index has gone up by 196% um, in that period of 40 years. For, for the you know the same uh, 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 goods and services uh, that were that were determined in the base year, and in fact the way we calculate the consumer price index is we have to first select the basket of goods and services that are representative, then we have to calculate uh, the price of that basket in the base year. Of course, we do a monthly CPI uh, monthly survey of prices for all those baskets, and then it enables us to calculate the CPI. Uh, each month and each year going forward. And so it's a pretty um, straightforward process. The basket is based on a consumer expenditure survey. We basically want to know what are things that people, what are what are a representative group of things that people are, are spending their money on. Those are the things we want to track. And you, as you can imagine, it's housing and food and medical care and uh, clothing and, and, and the, the, the various things that m most people most people need, but it does change uh, from time to time. And so this basket is updated and weighted um, based on a co consumer expenditure survey. The last one was done in 2013-14 um, time frame, so almost um, almost a decade ago. And when we look at the consumer price index, we can see those categories, the eight categories that things are bucketed into, and they're weighted. Um, the last weighting was done in, in, in 2021, and you can see that 42% um, um, uh, um, um, of the basket is on housing, and 18% uh, is on transportation, 14% is on food and beverage, medical care is 8.5, and you, each one of the main categories um, is, 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 is weighted there. And again, this is based on the... Um, representative uh, things that people are spending their money on. And here you can see once, this is for China from 2019, which is the latest available one I can get some data on, and the weights are different. This, is, you know, this kind of activity is done in each one of the countries, and you know, the, the market basket might be different because the, 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 the countries are different. China spends less on housing, about 23%, about the same on transportation, um, more on food, they have a separate category for alcohol and tobacco, and so you can make this basket, you know, depending upon which economy you're talking about, um, for, for, you know, for, the, for, um, for each one of the countries. Um, back to the United States, if we look at each one of the subcomponents, um, the prices are going up, but they're not all going up at the same rate, so things like apparel, clothing has actually gone down over time, and um, the red line here is medical care, uh, that's gone up quite a bit, and then you can see transportation bouncing around here, largely because energy resources like oil and natural gas are, um, are, are bouncing around also. So we can look at each one of the, cup, the, one of the components that make up the CPI, each one of the eight categories, and we can track those. Some of them are going to be going up more than others. Some of them are going to be um, um, 
maybe even go down, like a parallel in this case, um, and we can look at each one of the individual components. Now, so these are the eight components, the subcomponents that make up the consumer price index. Underneath those, uh, there's some more. So we can actually look here and see that college uh, tuition and fees, something um, we all kind of uh, pay attention to, that's going up even more than medical compare, care. So that's a, that's a subcomponent, college tuition and fees of one of the eight categories, and that's actually rising even, fa even faster, which should be no surprise to all of us. We've kind of lived and, and, and seen this. So the, uh, the point here is the index is made up of components, and some of the components rise faster than others and more than others uh, over time, and we can track that. Now, when, when we um, look at the uh, consumer price index, we can look at the monthly price survey. Every month, the Bureau of Labor Statistics checks the prices of some 80,000 goods and services. And they do that in 30 metropolitan areas. They're not doing this in, in, in rural America. They're doing this in, in, um, in, uh, in, in the major metropolitan areas, the 30 major metropolitan areas. And they're looking <laughs> and checking the prices on 80,000 goods and services. So you can kind of do the math there. And they're actually collecting lots and lots of data points on prices in lots and lots of different markets uh, each and, and every month. Now, to calculate the CPI, they have to look at, you know, what is the cost of the basket in the base year? And then we have to look at what the cost uh, of the basket is in the current period. And then we calculate the CPI by dividing the current by the base and multiplying by 100. So it's a fairly simple and straightforward calculation. We can look at an example. Um, assume we had a simple economy with only two products, oranges and haircuts. And we had a basket that included 10 oranges and five haircuts. Well, if the quantity, uh, if the price of the oranges was a dollar each and the haircuts were eight dollar each, then when we added up the price of the basket, it would come to fifty dollars. Uh, Ten dollars for the oranges, forty dollars for the haircuts, and a total of fifty dollars for the entire basket um, in in the base year, fifty dollars. So when we look at the at the, um, at the current year or the year we're looking at, now we look at the same goods and the same qualities, uh, quantities rather, that we had um, in the base year, but we use the prices from the current year. So again, we have oranges and haircuts. We have 10 oranges and five haircuts. And that regardless of, of, of how many oranges and haircuts we actually we were buying in the current year, we use the quantities from the base year. And then we obviously use the prices from the current year. We can see haircuts went up by a dollar and, I'm sorry, oranges went up by a dollar and haircuts went up by two dollars. So the total price of the basket is that is seventy dollars in the current year that used to cost fifty dollars in in the base year. And so to calculate the CPI, we um, we just divide the seventy dollar total from the current year by the fifty dollar total in the base year multiplied by 100, and we know that the consumer price index in the current year is 140. Now, the consumer price index in the base year is always equal to 100. Whatever that basket is uh, adds up to, we set that equal to 100. And so um, in the current year, it's 140. In the base year, it was 100. That means that the inflation rate is 40% that the same products and the same quantities in the current year were 40% more expensive or 40, had, had prices that were 40% higher than they did in, in, in the base year. And so that's how we do the calculation for the, for the consumer price index. And that's how we uh, are able to determine whether prices went up or down, whether we had inflation or deflation, and, and exactly how much the inflation or deflation was. Now. Like all economic aggregates, um, there, there's, this, there, there's this very specific definition on how the aggregate is constructed. Uh, but based on that definition and based on the methodology we use to calculate it, there may be some um, misstatements of the true inflation rate. 
So there's something called the new goods bias. There's some goods that were not available in the base year, and now they appear in the uh, in the current year. This might be electric cars or that are in the cars category, but certainly electric cars didn't exist uh, in the in, in, in an earlier time in the base year. So now we have these new goods, and they may be more expensive than some of the products that they're, that they're replacing. And so it seems like the price of cars has gone up, but really what the thing that we're calling a car is a completely different thing uh, in the current period and the base period. So this kind of puts an upward pressure. Um, these new goods appear to be, they, they, they may have a higher price, but not all of the higher price is because uh, the prices of the same goods go have, have gone up. It's, it's, it's in fact, um, um, uh, the, 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 they're completely new goods and new products, and, and the consumer price index can't handle that or can't account for that. In a similar way, newer versions of existing products, like the latest iPhone or the latest Android phones, are going to be m ha much improved in terms of qual quality compared to the original versions that might have been in the market basket originally. Products that have a much greater quality are going to also have higher prices. So the CPI counts all of the higher price as inflation when really some of it should be because the phone has much greater features and quality um, than the original one that was in the market basket. This is also true with the commodity substitution bias. We may not the, we may be not using the same products in the same quantities we in the current year we did in the base year. Many of us may have switched from cable to streaming. Um, but again, because of the way the CPI is calculated, because of the way the CPI is constructed, um, that switch of, of, of uh, moving from goods where the prices have gone up to goods that provide maybe a same function, substitutes where the prices are lower and maybe even gone down, doesn't get accounted for when we calculate the CPI. And lastly, the same thing is true with the outlet substitution bias. We may be buying more things from channels that ha involve uh, part of the value proposition is a lower price, like online shopping, uh, Amazon.com. But because of the way the CPI is calculated, we go out and check prices in different places. Uh, we may not capture this switch um, from one uh, retail channel to another uh, channel uh, adequately or completely or at all in the way the CPI is calculated. So all of these things, the fact that new goods arrive, the fact that the quality of goods changes, the fact that we will uh, substitute out um, um, higher price goods for lower price goods and the fact that we buy them from distribution channels which may offer lower prices uh, can can uh, are not accounted for in the, uh, 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 adequately or at all when we calculate the CPI. And so the CPI uh, may overstate the actual change in prices. Now, the Bureau of Labor Statistics deals with that by doing what they call hedonic quality adjustments. So they'll try to go in and try to factor in um, or factor out some of these uh, dynamics that are not captured in, in the CPI. So they go in and they might alter some of the statistics uh, and they call these hedonic quality adjustments um, in a similar way. Sometimes they can't get all the prices. Think of all the data points they're collecting. Maybe some of the data points that are not accessible to them um, as readily or frequently. So they'll actually do some estimation. Now, these um, the hedonic quality adjustments, the CPI estimation. Uh, on the one hand, these are good things because they're trying to remove uh, some deficiencies in the way the CPI is calculated. On the other hand, they add in biases. They add in another set of biases. Uh, we're now making adjustments and alterations and estimations. And anytime we're doing that, we're adding in just another set of ambiguities, another set of biases, and maybe another set of... Um, um, of, of, of errors. And so uh, we have to be careful when we're looking at the CPI data, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they publish a lot of detail on some of the adjustments they're making. The average person is not going to go and look at these 
uh, adjustments, but when we're seeing a number like a CPI number, we're seeing a numbers that have been uh, adjusted. We're seeing numbers that have been um, have been altered in, in many, many cases. Okay, so why does all this matter? Well, if the CP, if there's errors in the CPI, it can have big consequences. Uh, there are many private contracts which are linked to the CPI. Uh, many government contracts are also linked to the CPI. About one third of government contracts uh, are based off of changes to the CPI. Multi-year contracts might change uh, their prices if the CPI is changing. And so even a small 1% error can be a trillion dollars of a different uh, additional government spending over a, a decade. You can imagine what happens if it's three, four, five percent, which conceivably it could be based on the way we calculate the CPI and the adjustments we make and some of the efficiencies um, that still remain after we do the calculations and, and the adjustments. So um, CPI does matter because a lot of economic activity, a lot of economic contracts are based off of uh, the CPI. Now, let's talk about, so the CPI is the Consumer Price Index, that's the index that tries to measure the changes in prices over time. It tries to measure inflation and deflation over time. But there's something called the core inflation rate, which takes the, EC, the CPI and subtracts out what are considered to be the more volatile elements, food and energy. And the reason we have the core inflation is we're trying to get at the underlying inflation trend. So you can see that in... in uh, in, uh, in the graph here, um, the blue line is the consumer price index. Uh, the red line is the, is the core inflation rate. And so at times when the blue line is going up and down by a lot, the core inflation rate is, is more moderate. And so the purpose of the core inflation rate is to try to get at the underlying inflation rate. Um, minus the more volatile elements. Now, economists generally look at the core inflation rate as the, as the, as the indicator of inflation, more so than the CPI. The Federal Reserve, when they're doing uh, their work and their economics, looks at the core inflation rate as the, as the, as the measure of inflation. Um, I've always felt that this is a little bit of a game here, or gaming it a little bit, because you're taking out the more volatile elements, but what if the more volatile elements are the story? Yes, food and energy are increasing rapidly or, or, or more volatile, but that maybe that volatility is the story um, that we're after. Um, so I'm always a little suspect that removing food and energy from the CPI, I understand there are circumstances when you want to look at the core inflation rate and remove them, but I think you need to look at both the core inflation rate and the CPI. Otherwise, you, you, um, you, might, you might miss the, the actual story, which is the volatility in food and energy. Here's uh, a look at the current difference between the CPI inflation rate and the core inflation rate. So the CPI inflation rate is 9.1%. The core inflation rate for the same time period is 5.9%, a very big difference. Again, the core inflation rate removes from the CPI, the changes that are result from food and uh, energy. And so it's, it's definitely a lower number. It definitely uh, is less volatile, but it also leads, leaves out part of the story. It leaves out the story of the volatility in food and energy, um, which I think we have to come back to it sometimes. But that's the difference between the core inflation rate and the CPI inflation rate see here um, that food and energy sometimes <laughs> the, the, the CPI inflation rate is over here in red. Food is higher than that. That's one of the categories in the CPI that's, 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 um, that has a higher, but look at energy. That's gas and oil and, and uh, natural gas was way, way up. And so by removing these, yes, we get a lower here in green is the core inflation rate. It's certainly lower than the um, and CPI inflation rate, but it's removing these volatile categories, food and, um, and energy. Now, one of the ways that we use the price index, we use the CPI, um, is to 
turn nominal values into real values. A nominal value is a value that doesn't try to take into any uh, um, uh, any effects of, of, of inflation or deflation, of changes in prices. A real value is a value that has removed the changes in prices, that has removed the effects of inflation or deflation. And so the way we can take a nominal value and make a real value out of it is to divide the nominal value by the CPI and multiply it by 100. This is often done with wage rates. So wages may be rising. Uh, the nominal wage rate may be rising. But in a period of high inflation, it, th they may be rising slower than inflation. And so the real wage rate may be shrinking. And this is kind of what's happening now uh, in July of 2022. The Wage rates are rising. They're up about almost 5% per year. But inflation uh, is up by a higher amount. So the nominal wage rate is rising. But when we factor out the effects of inflation, we can change. We can see that the real wage rate has actually gone down. Workers are, uh, um, uh, in effect, their purchasing power is 2 to 3% lower even with the higher nominal wage than it was before the higher nominal wage and before the inflation. So nominal wages can be up, but if we don't account for the changes in prices, if we don't account for inflation, we'll miss the fact that real wages are down. And so this is one of the ways that we use um, the CPI data. One of the ways we use the inflation data is to try to understand um, not only the changes in prices, but the, but the changes in, uh, um, in prices after we've accounted for inflation and deflation. Now, I'll end um, by pointing out that prices are complex phenomena. When we see prices, we're actually seeing three sets of economic forces manifest themselves at the same time. We know that prices are determined by supply and demand. And so when we see a price, supply and demand are at play, that's part of what we're seeing. We also know that over time that prices are affected through the market process that plays out through time, through the process of competition. And so sometimes the prices that we're seeing are, are being affected or changed um, or being subject to the dynamics of, um, of the market process and competition. And then lastly, um, prices exist in the context of a monetary system. Um, and if the money supply is increasing dramatically, sometimes that will cause inflation and we can see higher prices. And so um, uh, the, the point here is that uh, when we see prices, we're really seeing three sets of economic dynamics happening at the same time. The dynamics of supply and demand, the dynamics of competition, and then the dynamics of the monetary system and the monetary policy all happening and showing up um, in prices all at the same time.